the live streaming has started if the panel would like to begin good evening i'm rinalini sen and i thank you all for joining us this evening this virtual canteen by dhc women lawyers forum was born out of a tragedy our first virtual canteen was a remembrance for two young lady lawyers from delhi high court whose lives had abruptly come to an end much before their time shortly after lockdown at the remembrance organized online it became apparent that us women lawyers desperately need a platform to connect with each other i'm sure all of us have at one time or another felt isolated and lonely during our practice of law the forum has been an excellent avenue to forge new relationships get career advice jointly celebrate our lives our success and our failure and of course share judgments and orders soumya and i hope you will enjoy this virtual canteen over to you soumya to forge is to shape a metal by heating it in fire and hitting it with a hammer any object so created lasts long and is strong forging is an arduous task requiring conscious unrelenting efforts to achieve the desired result and the mahatma truly forged india's path to independence in his unique way he is best known to the world for his non violent struggle for india's independence or swaraj as he would call it but gandhi ji led nationwide campaigns for easing poverty expanding women's rights building religious and ethnic amity ending untouchability and raising environmental consciousness gandhi famously said my life is my message on the occasion of his 151st birth anniversary the delhi high court women lawyers forum has organized this virtual canteen where our masterly speakers will share their individual life journeys with our audience to inspire us and to help us forge our own path gandhi ji's favorite hymn was abide with me and on this special occasion two advocates from the delhi high court dr mercy debra currently teaching at the op jindal law school and miss daisy hana will perform a 3 minute instrumental version of abide with me daisy will be playing the violin while mercy will be on the keyboard Ritika, you will have to share your audio.
you, Dr. Debra and Daisy, for that wonderful rendition of Abide With Me. Without any further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Justice Muldihar, who is a beloved judge of the Delhi High Court, and of course now of Punjab and Haryana High Court. While reading his bio sheet, it became immediately apparent that Sir's area of focus was legal aid and representing the marginalized. Sir has been a lawyer and a member of the Supreme Court Legal Services Committee and chairperson of Delhi High Court Legal Services Committee. He was also awarded his doctorate for his thesis on law, poverty, and legal aid, access to criminal justice. Most lawyers like myself are constantly bombarded with messaging that glorifies only money and getting bribed with briefs. Sir's career and path provides an alternative narrative for a successful career in law to many like myself. Justin Mulidhar is not only an inspiration in the courtroom as a judge, but I can also say was an inspiring, was as inspiring as the chairperson of the Delhi High Court Legal Services Committee, where I had the fortune to experience his leadership. I've been a panel lawyer with DLSA and Delhi High Court Legal Services Committee for approximately five years. And after Sir came to the helm, it was like a breath of fresh air. The panel was not only called for a wonderful tea session to discuss our problems and concern, Sir also hosted a movie evening of Akrosh about a lawyer's first legal aid case and organized lectures by some of the leading members of the bar. The message was clear to us, legal aid lawyers, that what we did was important and appreciated. This in turn enthused us to work harder. Thank you, sir, for being such an inspiration. Now I request Soumya to introduce Ms. Minakshi Arora, senior advocate. Thank you, Manali. Our second guest for the evening is the superlative lawyer who has the credit of securing the workplace for all women in India and giving nota vote to the nation. Her efforts in the Sakshi case yielded into framing of guidelines for examination of children who, be who become victims of sexual abuse. She became, the, she became only the fifth woman lawyer to be designated, by a, uh, designated a senior by the Supreme Court of India. She entered the profession in 1984 and has now spent 46 years at the bar. She chose to become a lawyer against the advice of her family and her journey from being an outsider to one of the most sought after formidable lawyers in the country gives this message to all young entrants that if one has the courage to choose and conviction to stand by their choice and keep working hard, success and recognition will not evade one for long. We all know a lot about Ms. Minakshi Arora's journey from seeing her in the court and reading about her work and reading about her work in the media. But today we have the opportunity to hear from her about her life and her choices and how she forged her own path. We are all waiting with bated breath to listen to our guest speakers. So without wasting any further time, I now request Honorable Justice Moldidhar to share his thoughts with us. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Am I audible? Uh, I wish to thank the Delhi High Court Women Lawyers Forum for inviting me. It's lovely to be amongst friends, to see so many of them here. It's always a joy coming back to address uh, Delhi High Court lawyers and lawyers in Delhi. Uh, the topic, of course, is uh, so apt for the day, because uh, here we are talking on the day we remember. A person who engaged with the law as a lawyer himself, before he entered the political stream. And much of what he did as a lawyer influenced his politics. I would like to therefore modify the topic, forging one's path with the words as a lawyer. And uh, I, know, I don't know if I will disappoint some of you. I'm not going to talk about my own experiences at all. I think much of that is already there in the public domain. So, I'm going to talk of uh, lives of uh, certain others who have engaged with the law and uh, I think whose lives are very inspiring for all of us. Each of us has different sources of inspiration in our lives. It could be a close relative, it could be a teacher, it could be a variety of persons for different reasons and for different purposes. When we talk of uh, inspiration for a lawyer who wants to forge her own path, I think we're looking at certain skills that a lawyer needs to uh, imbibe. First is the ability to read well, read widely, 
and read deep. The second, the ability to question what one reads, to want to refine one's understanding by opening oneself to conflicting viewpoints. Third, to sharpen one's analytical skills using a good common sense developed by watching, absorbing, and interacting with the immediate and the larger social environment, and then applying the law. Fourth, and uh, which I think we need to remind ourselves constantly and more as judges, to listen well and ensure that legalese does not drown out the story that needs to be narrated in the court. Fifth, and this is a very important skill which is not often acknowledged, the ability to negotiate, to be able to see an issue from all points of view and weigh carefully the pros and cons. And of course, lastly, to be able to present a case well, both in writing and in oral arguments. This requires a command over language, and I'm not merely meaning English, but uh, language of most courts is English and law is written in English. So having a command over language and over words, and this can only develop through deep reading because ultimately you need to be able to communicate. Communicate through the written or the spoken word or sometimes through your silences because you also need to know when not to speak. In fact, uh, they constantly keep reminding you the art of cross-examination is learning to is, uh, knowing when to stop asking questions, when to let go, when to go slow. It is a challenge as a lawyer and particularly in a bar that is continuing to be dominated, male dominated, to move out of one's safe zone and step into a scenario of conflict, to retain your balance while examining the issue from a legal perspective informed by one's understanding of the interplay between law and society and the system at work. And uh, this is the reason why I have chosen the uh, uh, instances in talking of certain lives. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. And like I said, you draw inspiration from various sources. I know many of you are aware of this, but I just wish to uh, recollect that when the Constituent Assembly sat down to uh, undertake this humongous task of drafting India's constitution. There were 15 women in the Constituent Assembly and included the likes of uh, Amu Swaminathan, Rajkumari Abhidkar, and Mehta. The person I wish to speak about is Dakshayani Velayudan. And she was the only woman amongst the 15 who belonged to the scheduled caste. And she was born in a Kulaya community in Mulavakkar, a village in Ernakulam district in Kerala. She was born in 1912. She completed her graduation in 1935. Trained to be a teacher by attending and qualifying in a course with Madras University in 1938. And all this through scholarships. She taught for 10 years in government high schools in Kerala. She was an astute Gandhian. And uh, in fact, she got married in the presence of Mahatma Gandhi and Kasturba in Sevagram and Varda. She got married to Mr. Velayudan, who was himself a member of parliament later and belonged not to the Congress, but to the Socialist Party. And they got married with Kasturba and Gandhiji as witnesses and as a leper and a leper acting as a priest. In 1945, she got nominated to the Cochin Legislative Assembly. And then from 1946 onwards, she participated in the Constitutional Assembly and spoke forcefully on issues affecting the scheduled castes. In fact, this is attributed to her, this quote, we cannot expect a constitution without a clause relating to untouchability. And uh, she was a great support to Dr. Ambedkar in the Constitutional Assembly. And she continued also in the provincial parliament till 1952. 
She also was an editor of a magazine called Jay Bhim, which was based in Madras. Not much is known about uh, Dakshayani Velayadu, but she should, I think, be remembered. And uh, one should draw inspiration from people like her who fought against the tide, the social tide, uh, overcame the personal disadvantages and made best of the opportunities that opened out to her. The second person I wish to speak about is the first judge in any court in India. I know, I'm, I'm sure all of you recall the name of Anna Chandi. She was a Syrian Christian, born in 1905, raised in Trivandrum in Kerala. She obtained a postgraduate degree in 1926. The ruler of Tra Travancore, Maharani Setubai, against the uh, popular opinion during that time, opened up the government law college in uh, Trivandrum to girls in 1927. And Anna Chandi was amongst the first batch of those who graduated from there. She began her practice in 1929 in criminal law and at the same time began editing a magazine called, a journal called Srimati, which was uh, devoted to issues concerning women. She contested for the elections to be what was then known as the Sri Moolam Popular Assembly in Travancore in 1930. She lost the first election, but persisted and then continued to serve. She was elected and continued to serve in that assembly between 1932 and 1934. And even in that role, she fought for the proportional revisive issue for women in government offices. The word, uh, she's probably one of the earliest feminists that uh, we know of. And this is again attributed to her. When a fellow legislator opposed her proposal for reservation for women in government jobs, she had this to say. From the elaborate petition, it is clear that the plaintiffs, that is the person opposing, plaintiffs immediate demand is to ban all efforts by women to gain employment on the ground that they are creatures created for the domestic pleasures of men and that their lives outside the hallowed kitchen temples will harm familial happiness. Remarkably, when a law was proposed to exempt women from the death penalty, she opposed it. She also opposed a law that permitted men to exercise conjugal rights without the consent of the wife. She asked how many women have been condemned to depth of feelings of inferiority because of the foolish idea that women's body is an instrument for the pleasure of man. Clearly, Anna Chandi was far ahead of her time. Uh, talking of issues which I don't think uh, a male-dominated society of those times would be able to uh, find palatable. But she persisted and succeeded. She was appointed as a Munsif in Travancore in 1937 by the then Divan of Travancore, C.P. Ramaswamy Ayer. And uh, this again is attributed to her. She says, I knew I was a test case. If I faltered or failed, I would not just be damaging my own career, but would be doing great disservice to the cause of women. Something very similar to what one heard Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg say later when she was reminiscing about her, her career on the bench. Uh, Anna Chandy became an additional district judge in 1943, a district judge in 1948, and the first woman high court judge in this country in 1959. And she retired in 1967. She then had a stint in the Law Commission of India. And through her life, her husband, P.C. Chandi, who was an Inspector General of Police, was a great support to her. I don't know if I have the time, but I'm uh, going to uh, make a quick uh, 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 summary of the life of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. 
as all of us know she was born in 1933 and uh, early on she uh, suffered a tragedy when her mother died of cancer when uh, ginsburg was just graduating from the high school she went to cornell and there met and married martin ginsburg in 1955 she joined the harvard law school in 1956 and she was one among just nine women in the entire batch in harvard law school once her husband who was also uh, 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 studying law in harvard passed out in 1958 she shifted to the columbia law school and came out on the top of her class in 1959 but uh, ruth bader ginsburg encountered the same problems that many women uh, face even today in the legal profession not finding an opening and uh, it is interesting that when she applied for law clerkship with a very strong recommendation from her professor when she applied to the chambers of justice felix frankfurt she was turned down and uh, the same professor then put in a strong recommendation with another federal court judge who took her on and found her to be one of the most efficient law clerks and uh, she worked in that capacity for 2 years and then entered the field of academics in fact later i don't know how many of you have seen the documentary rbg she reminisces she says that uh, three things worked against her one she was a woman second she was a jew and third that she was married with a child and uh, she found entry into any law firm extremely difficult on these uh, accounts she taught in the rajas university uh, and then later came to columbia university but what is remarkable is that she associated herself with the american civil liberties union and from 1972 onwards started preparing the briefs for major test cases where the issue of gender equality would have to be addressed by the court and what is interesting is she picked up cases not on just behalf of women but also on behalf of men because that was what she was trying to push the idea of equality and that discrimination hurts everyone men and women so in fact you have amongst the several cases she argued three cases that she argued on behalf of widowers who were being denied social security or tax benefits when they were single carers She argued as many as five cases before the Supreme Court of the U.S. and won five of them. She continued arguing briefs till she got elevated to the Federal Court of Appeals in 1980 during the Carter administration. She served in that capacity till 1993 when President Clinton appointed, nominated her to the Supreme Court, and she got confirmed the Senate by a vote of uh, 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 96 to three. So, which is a remarkable approval rate for anyone. I think what is uh, uh, what stands out in Justice Ginsburg's career as a judge are the powerful dissents that she wrote. Apart in, apart from some major uh, landmark opinions, if you watch the R B G documentary, it's also in the form of a book. You come across uh, all those judgments and her opinions, but her dissents were very powerful. In fact, she. earned the moniker of notorious rbg and she was a great icon a great inspiration for whole generations of uh, law students law academics judges uh, in one of the uh, decisions which concerned the issue of limitation for a woman to claim discrimination on the ground of uh, unequal pay for the same kind of work the majority opinion in the supreme court Uh, turned down the plea on the ground of limitation saying that at the first instance when she was paid less the woman should have come forth with her plea whereas ruth bader ginsburg was saying that it is only when she truly became aware of what the others were getting paid that she realized that she was being discriminated against and therefore the limitation should not be held against her although she dissented that dissent was so powerful when that when president obama took over they enacted the lily ledbetter ledbetter fair pay act so which also tells us that the dissents that you write on the uh, supreme court are equally valuable and equally important 
as the majority opinions. And as we've seen in our own country, the dissenting opinions of one time can become the majority opinions in a later point of time. And it can even inspire change in legislation. And this is one great example of that. What Ruth Bader Ginsburg is also known is for her incremental approach to changes in the law. And she is quoted as saying, real change, enduring change happens one at a time. I would just like to end when she was asked uh, in an interview, uh, how many judges she, she think she, uh, she thought that the US Supreme Court should have, which would be adequate. She answered nine. Uh, she till the end stood uh, you know, firm on her convictions on certain uh, essential values, constitutional values. And uh, she will always be remembered for that. And this is a path that she forged for herself through hard work, through determination, through combining various skills. And uh, she had a, a family to look after, but she had a very supportive husband who was able to share tasks with her. What is also remarkable about Ginsburg is the training to be a lawyer. One of her, the first uh, major books that she wrote was on the civil procedure in Sweden. So this also tells you that you need to engage with the law formally, train yourself thoroughly professionally, even before you begin to take up courses and to also time the litigation. Mridali, how much time do we have now? I mean, do we have to sum up or do we have time? So you have 15 minutes more. <laughs> <laughs> and I talk about uh, Gandhiji and Ambedkar. Uh, we know a lot about Gandhiji, but uh, not enough is spoken about his life as a lawyer. And I have given a talk some years ago in the Supreme Court Bar Association. I don't wish to uh, elaborate too much on his life as a lawyer, but there are some facets of his life as a lawyer which I think we should remind ourselves because these are truly inspiring. One is that... Uh, uh, contrary to the popular perception, Gandhiji was a very successful lawyer. He uh, graduated from the Inner Temple, I mean, took Bharat Law from the Inner Temple. When he came back to Bombay in 1891, he found the going very tough. In fact, he thought he was not even cut out for lawyering. But it was pure chance that, you know, he got to uh, go to South Africa to be involved in a litigation between two Indian merchants. And uh, Dada Abdullah, who was his client, was located in uh, Pretoria. And uh, in his first journey from Durban to uh, Pretoria, in the train at Peter Maritzburg, you have the famous incident where, despite having a ticket to uh, ride in the first class compartment, he's ejected out onto the station when he refuses to move to a different compartment. And then even the journey from Peter Maritzburg to Pretoria, when he has to ride on a stagecoach, is forced to sit with the uh, driver and not in the porch. So these had very lasting, deep impressions on him. But what is fascinating is the very first case he got involved in ended in a settlement. And Gandhiji was uh, majorly responsible for bringing the parties to settle the dispute. And he's quoted as saying that the true function of a lawyer, he realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties riven asunder. It's remarkable, he was just 24 years old, and this was 1893. And then circumstances made him stay back in Durban. And one of the circumstances was that there were law taking away the voting rights of British citizens in NATO, <coughs> where Durban was located. And he uh, uh, asked the Indian community there, would they not like to question this, this unjust law? So here we're talking of a legal system which is hostile to the Indians there. They're colored and they don't have full rights of citizenship. And as British citizens, Gandhi is imploring them to petition. So one of the first tasks he undertook was to actually write out petitions questioning the unjust law. And this is a practice that he would develop throughout his stay in Durban. Almost 10 years he practiced as a barrister there. And uh, despite the hostile environment, and probably he's one of the very few colored lawyers in Durban at that time, he took up difficult cases. He took up difficult positions. He had a very close reading of the law. If you have to petition a government to withdraw a bill, you have to learn to read it very carefully. And this was a time when there was no constitutional uh, red jurisdiction of, for, for you know, going to the court, striking down a law. There was nothing of that sort. 
and he was also very well versed in civil law commercial law so he took on a variety of cases he was extremely successful as a barrister in bevel and then political reasons when post the boer war uh, he decided to shift to uh, transfer to johannesburg to resume his practice they would not admit him to the bar there so he settled to be an uh, attorney giving up his successful practice as a barrister and uh, what i think we should know about his uh, stint in johannesburg is that he took up test litigation as a device to challenge unjust laws so when the electric tram cars were introduced in johannesburg and they had segregation so the uh, uh, coloreds were not allowed to ride in the same tram cars as the europeans and the whites he challenged that and he brought that test litigation to the lowest of the courts to the magistrates courts so he was an extremely you know persistent uh, uh, in his uh, convictions in his beliefs and in a way the personal became the political and uh, what he brought uh, to the courts were political issues which he was conscious of political that he was addressing a larger audience but he also drew on the community for instance for the test litigation challenging the uh, uh, segregation in tram cars he had the wealthy indian businessmen buy a ticket and get into the you know car try, try to get into the tram car that they were not permitted to ride so somewhere he got the entire community involved in these issues so that is remarkable about uh, gandhi ji's life as a lawyer and uh, again this is a story of uh, constant reading constant uh, uh, you know openness to different thoughts different ideas and he drew inspiration from ruskin from thoreau from tolstoy and this was a man who was constantly engaging with his own you know limitations with his own uh, frailties and never afraid to speak of them to write of them so young india it was a constant reading writing engaging and so you could you could actually follow the progress of gandhi's uh, you know intellectual development through his uh, you know outpouring of writings and today we are able to be even critical of gandhi ji i think we owe it to him that he laid out there for everyone to see his thought process at any given point in time so that is what one thing was remarkable about him and then i think the other thing also is that uh, when you take a certain position and when you find that it does not yield the kind of results that you think it should yield you should learn to step back and here i want to uh, refer to the chauri chaur incident which happened when a police station was uh, uh, you know surrounded and set on fire and this was during the civil disobedience movement and once he knew that there was violence gandhi ji stepped back and called off the civil disobedience movement and at different points in his life you could see him you know uh trying uh, to uh, uh step back view objectively what he you know proposed and be willing to engage with an opposition there was a civility in the debate there was a willingness to engage with uh, opposing points of view sit at the table and not run away from it you know uh, this this ability i think if lawyers develop it will be remarkable because when you negotiate you're always uh, you know faced with a counter point of view and uh, if you want to bring about a result that is acceptable you must learn to negotiate you must learn to you know uh, uh, calibrate your responses and time your uh, uh, strategies the last person i wish to talk about in this uh, list of very inspiring people is of course baba saheb ambedkar and it's a remarkable life again a person who through his own effort personal effort uh, you know went from step to step and i'll quickly cut down to this uh, post his graduation from elphinstone college in bombay he gets the sayaji rao gaikwad scholarship from baroda and travels to colombia and between 1913 and 1916 he finishes an ma in economics and uh, in 1917 he goes to london and uh, enrolls for a doctorate in the london school of economics and at the same time enrolls with the grays in to be a barrister it so happened that his scholarship dried up so he had to come back to india in 1917 and all his books and notes which were coming in a ship got torpedoed by a torpedo torpedoed by a german uh, submarine and uh, it took him 4 years to be able to go back to london to complete his doctorate to be called to the bar all this happened in 1923 
and Ambedkar taught in the meanwhile in Sadalum College as a professor of political economy. Later, between 1935 and 1937, Ambedkar was also principal of the government law college in Bombay. He practiced law uh, for a few years in the 20s. And later, I don't know how many of you are aware, the famous Kameshwar Singh judgment in the Supreme Court, if you go through the appearances, Dr. Ambedkar has appeared for the petitioners, Kameshwar Singh and others. So his engagement with the law was, uh, you know, hands-on. And uh, I think his experiences in life, the discrimination he faced, not just as a child, not just while he was uh, pursuing college education, but even later when he was in faculties, whether it's in faculties and colleges or elsewhere, he encountered discrimination. And he had a very deep understanding of the caste divisions, studied the scripts very carefully. So even before you criticize, you need to study. So this gaining knowledge through reading, learning through life's experiences and constantly engaging, like for instance, uh, John Dewey was a great inspiration for Dr. Ambedkar, as was Bertrand Russell. And uh, I think, I don't know how many of you are aware of Sharvila Rege's work against the madness of Manu. If you read Dr. Ambedkar's essays on caste and that, it's really an eye-opener. Unless a person had studied the scriptures, the Manuspriti and other texts so carefully, he could not have had such an incisive analysis of how the caste structure works in this country. So again, an instance of uh, intellectual uh, engagement with the law. And when you go through the Constituent Assembly debates, Ambedkar is a very tall figure there. And but for Dr. Ambedkar, I don't think we would have had provisions like Article 17 and 23 in the Indian Constitution. We have, therefore, only the Indian Constitution where untouchability is described as an offense in the Constitution itself. And he somehow prophesied that right putting these provisions in the Constitution was not going to be enough. It was going to be a lifelong engagement. And uh, his prophecy is true. Even today, we are far you know, from uh, uh, stating that we've overcome untouchability in this country. It is still a huge blot on Indian society that it still uh, you know, uh, shames us every now and then. So I just want to summarize what we can learn from all these lives. One is, of course, the deep pervasive reading and uh, the uh, uh, importance of education in one's lives. Each one of them has emphasized this importance of education as the only road to progress. But education is not just through books, but learning through life's experiences, one's own experiences, others' experiences, and an inquiring mind that does not accept a status quo. And I think lawyers need to develop that. Because if you want to bring about law reform, you want to bring about systemic change, you need to do it from within. You cannot afford to be cynical. You cannot say the system is broken down. It's useless because there are several people waiting for justice. And you, can't, you, know, you cannot give up. You are the system. You should believe that as much as you believe in the rule of law and democracy, you must believe in constitutional values. You must believe in the values of liberty, freedom, equality, dignity, fraternity. And this becomes the uh, uh, creed, not just in the professional life, but in one's personal life. So when we talk of forging one's path as a lawyer in the Indian scenario, you must embrace the constitution. I don't think there is an option on this. You must embrace the constitution. You must practice those constitutional values, democratic values in your personal sphere. You cannot have one behavior in your personal sphere and another behave, uh, behavior professionally. It will show up. Those hypocrisies will weaken your stance you lose your moral authority or legitimacy to represent causes if you, have, if you persist in that dichotomy. Whatever may be your political beliefs, whatever may be your personal religious beliefs, as a lawyer, you cannot have a, 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 a position that is contrary to what the constitutional values speak. So when we talk of Ambedkar's contribution to the development of law in the country, I would put on the highest, uh, in the first in the list, constitutional morality. Ambedkar's notion of constitutional morality is something that I think all law persons, law students, lawyers must embrace. Whatever be the cause you're fighting for, whatever be the client you're representing, there is a certain basic, you know, uh, minimum stance that one takes, and that should embrace these constitutional values. 
and if that is very clear then many other things can easily fall in place second what we learn is that there's no compromise on being thoroughly professional so you have to learn your skills completely thoroughly it's a continuous learning process the law school only prepares you for the greater learning that you have at the bar or in a law firm or wherever you are whether you're teaching as a law academic uh that uh, uh being thoroughly professional being skilled like gandhi ji really believe believed in facts speaking for themselves he's quoted as saying that we should not have embellishments in pleadings no adjectives these are all gandhi ji's actual you know learning through his life as a lawyer that the case argues itself and that is very important third the ability to transcend one's limitations drawing on inner strengths and realizing the full potential of the opportunities all of them forged their own paths but they had help along the way they certainly had help they do not deny that but what did they do with that help what did they do with that push that is very important and uh, they somehow realized the full potential not withstanding the initial failures the drawbacks they persisted and that is very very important for us to learn from these lives last taking people along i think they all believed in the civility of debate of dissent of discussion and uh, that violence is not a means to resolving you know conflicts i think they all believed in that so they're talking of you know uh, civility in pers- uh, public discourse and persuasion through the power of reasoning and that is what is most appealing to all of us and uh, each of them i've chosen i mean these names because they forged their own paths without any legacy they were the first in their fields uh and 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 the set out to establish certain norms which we still look up to i mean which we still want to uh, abide by and remind us that uh, this is a work in progress and that it is possible it can be done because the adversarial uh, the the situation through which the lives through uh, their lives were in times that was far hostile and uh, then many of us are having to uh, encounter right now and even in the bar even in your within your women lawyers uh, forum uh, i think you should watch out for practices of discrimination practices of inequality because uh, we are not a homogeneous lot even as women we are not a homogeneous lot we are stratified ambedkar reminded us of graded inequality and that graded inequality gets mirrored everywhere where there is a gathering of people so bar is also a reflection of the society and we need to constantly interrogate that like when we talk of transgenders for instance have we engaged in the situation of you know transgenders as lawyers where do they stand as lawyers will they be in the men's room or the women's room have we thought of that i mean this could be another challenge that you know is thrown to us when we really talk of inequality when we talk of constitutional values at is i think it is important to constantly engage with the issues that crop up and interrogate that first conquer our inner demons because we all have come with our own you know prejudices biases and this is a constant reminder to even judges every time every day we sit in court and every case we take up we must be conscious of this hidden biases within oneself the inner demons which we have to conquer and each of these five persons whose lives have talked about their lifelong mission was to conquer those inner demons and to come out on top and establish norms and principles far beyond their own you know uh, immediate uh, need or requirement and serve a larger cause so which is why i found that truly inspiring thank you very much thank you for listening to me these inspirational lives with us and of course the last part of your talk left us with so much to think of and so many questions that are still remaining unanswered well uh, now i request minakshi ma'am to share her thoughts with us on the topic of the day over to you ma'am hi good evening thank you for having me here and thank you for 
having me together with Justice Murlidhar, I feel so small and so inadequate in face of all that he has said. But as my dear friend, as we used to call him on the bar, Murli, he's so self-effacing, he would not talk about himself at all. I'm going to go back in time and in memory and tell you a few things about him when we talk about the parts that we forge for ourselves. So what is it that we are and what are the parts that we land up forging for ourselves? When I came to Delhi and I started with Ryan Karanjawala's office, I remember my dear friend Murli, if I can call you, please, you may be a judge there, but there are times that we go back a long way, was with, just, was with Mr. G. Ramaswamy's office. So those were the days you see each other running down the corridors and stuff. And then GR was a completely commercial lawyer. He was a very brilliant man, but his instinct was commerce, commerce. And here I saw this dear friend of mine come out of the chamber, learn a lot from him, and yet his heart and his values were all for rights, for the poor, for the dom trodden. We watch Murli carrying on, becoming an advocate on record, doing his matters in the court, and by and large, now today, I wish this is what you were going to do, and I would have pulled out a list, but then it would have gotten a little bit boring. So this is impromptu. So please forgive me if I don't have all those details, but because you've been so self-effacing, I have to do this today for you. So then we watched him carry on doing all matters which has rights. The one that strictly that comes to my mind immediately is the Otto Shankar matter, which was a huge issue on right of privacy. Much before we argued Puttaswamy, here is your judge who argued the case that he may be on a death row, he may be a convict, but he has a right of privacy and his life story cannot be just exposed like that to anyone. And if I'm not correct, Murli, that's the matter that sticks, that stays on this law books even today. I wish you had spoken more about that and given us. Now, the second part of it that I remember of him is as a standing counsel for the election commission. He had the hardest time as the standing counsel for election commission because Session was the chief election commissioner and who took his decisions overnight which were always in conflict with what the Supreme Court had to do. So every day, either Murli was caught to the court in matters which came up against Session's decision, or he was present before the court defending some of those decisions, which were very hard to defend. I remember him in the morning before the chief court in all those election matters, and my God, what a time it was with Session as Chief Commissioner, as the Chief Election Commissioner and Murlidhar as the Standing Counsel. You know, for all the work that he did and his clients who came from all walks of life, I remember Murli till the end had this little Maruti van, which was his office, which was parked in the Supreme Court compound, and he would carry out his work from this little van. He would draft his matters, he would read up his briefs, and he would run down to the court and argue his matters. And as life called him to the most, I think that's the best thing that has happened because some people are born to be judges because their hearts are in the right place. Now, something before I part on this one, and I still have to say, we were at a National Judicial Academy together doing one of the sessions with Madhav Menon, where we were reviewing all the labor laws. As usual, Madhav Menon had divided us into two groups, one groups which was pro-industry. And of course, me, where would I go? I came from Ryan's chamber, had done all those excise and the corporate matters. The heart was in that place beating for the industry. My friend on the other side. And you know what a tug of war we had on that, but as a judge, he used each one of those instincts, his heart being on the right place to do the right thing for the people who needed it. 
And that is what is reflected in his judgments, which is done in the court. So you may not have spoken about yourself, but the little bit that I can, that's the parts that we forge. You know, as I say, when we part that we forge for ourselves and when we really want to force them, they come from our courage of conviction. You have to have a conviction about certain things and you have to have the courage to stand up for those convictions. Because if you don't have that courage to stand up for what you believe, then whatever be your convictions are of no use really. So this is what I credit him with, that he forged his path because he had his convictions he had the heart in the right place and he had the courage to stand up for his beliefs. I had this little talk on Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she's so much currently an issue of very unfortunate passing away. And she's been a mentor to many of us. I have really looked up to her for many years. I'm going to only add two things to what uh, my friends already said about her. You know, she was amongst she was on the Harvard Law Review within few months of her being in her first year in the Harvard Law College, and which was something very hard to do. Now, when she passed out her law school, her husband was already practicing in New York. He was a bright young lawyer in one of the top law firms, and she had other friends who were there. They tried very hard for her to get into a good law firm in New York because she had passed out and she was an exceptionally brilliant young woman. They were shocked. None of the law firms that they spoke to were willing to take a woman on their term. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg was denied a position in a law firm. And that's when she turned towards academics to teach at the Harvard Law School there. She goes back into academics and she teaches there and then forged her career to becoming a law clerk and thereafter moving on to becoming a US Supreme Court judge. But having said that, you know, there is some amount of metal that we have within us to push ourselves, to get to the parts that we wish to forge for ourselves, to reach the positions that we want to do. Each one of us has an aspiration to be known, to do well, to, be, to have our careers, et cetera. It's not each one of us who's able to make it, but we all make it to whatever levels we can. For her, for Justice Ginsburg, when the nominations had to happen to the Supreme Court of the US, she was far too self-effacing, just like my friend who wouldn't talk for himself, she wouldn't go and push herself to be appointed to the Supreme Court of the US, although she was she completely met with all the requirements of that particular position. So it is her husband who then took it upon himself and who was a career lawyer in New York. He was a tax lawyer and he virtually knew everyone who was there in the capitalist US industries because he was a very fine tax lawyer and who knew a lot of people and then started the movement for her which got her into the position of what she later on did. Of course, that Senate, if you watch her thing at the Senate and her approval at the Senate, that's entirely Justice Ginsburg, nobody else. And at a point where the, I forget who was heading that Senate says that your and my views may be different, but I have to accept the fact that you have a very strong voice and you know, you're know you welcome to the US Supreme Court. But, but at some stages in our career, undoubtedly, we may need a little push. And that little helping hand or that little push is important. You know, women generally are very often do not push themselves. And that is why many of us do not make that mark. But don't forget her words. And I say this today and I would repeat it always. And I would say that for women councils, for the women judges in our country. But somebody asked Justice Ginsburg, now that you are at the US Supreme Court, what do you think about the US Supreme Court? You are the two of you. So I'm sure you look at it as being 50-50, 50% women, 50% men. And she turned around and said, no, 
I see it as nine because men have occupied it all these years, all nine. So why should women not be there, all nine of them at the Supreme Court? And I think she had a very valid point. Women have been traditionally underrepresented in diverse places, particularly, and I say this today when we talk about forging our paths and forging our careers, women have a complete underrepresentation in the parliament, the legislative bodies. That's the place where our laws are made, the laws which are going to directly impact us, the laws that require debate. We have hardly any presence of women in legislative process. You look at the change that has happened in countries like Africa. They had a huge strife. They had huge amount of corruptions. Lot of women started coming forward and started contesting for legislative positions. Today, Africa has the highest women representation. Most African countries range between 30 to a maximum of about 60% women in their legislative bodies. Now compare it with countries which have been far more advanced for many, many years. If you look at the US, you look at the, uh, the European countries, the representation ranges between 20, if you're very lucky, maybe 30%. So it is, it's is—it's not necessary that just because countries have had education, they have advancement, that women have moved forward in those countries. No, it's not so. It is the circumstances that has very often made women step out of their comfort zones and to take in the central roles to take in the central roles. Having said that, I do believe today, there is time now for women to forge their own paths. We, in the legal profession, when I came in, and this was 1986 in the Supreme Court, we were barely about 30 or 40 women there. Many of us eventually left because they became homemakers, they had children, you didn't have all those comforts that you have today, where you can do a career and still have a home together. So eventually, if I remember my 30, 40, we were eventually, if I look back now from 86 to today, we may have been hardly about six or seven or maybe 10 of us who survived from that point in time and the rest all moved away. But in the last few years, a lot more women have come into the profession and there is a change. Now is the change for women now to say they can make it as counsels, they can make it as judges. And there is a need to have much more judges there on the judiciary than we have today. Because there is a viewpoint that women bring with them. There is a different viewpoint that it's, it's not a matter of just the constitutional values, uh, Justice Murlidhar. It's also a the same constitutional values that women look at it differently at times from what the men can do, you know? And those constitutional values, when I talk about, whether it was Vishakha at its time in 1997, which started in 1991 or 92, to think that women should have protection at their place of work so that they can work as freely as any next man there to the point where how are we going to protect women or young children? And, and this is just to cite two examples, but there are many others, to the point that we spoke about transgenders, to the point that we spoke about, uh, you know, uh, same sex relationships, we have come a long way. And every time we have looked at the constitutional provisions, the fundamental rights with a new look, but the presence of women there is the presence that makes you look at the same provisions with a different perspective. And hence their presence is equally required. Lastly, let's not forget, we form 50% of the population. We may not form 50% of the representation on the bar at the moment, but I'm sure as we are growing, we will do. But there is nothing to stop to have the representation more. And do not give them the position just because they're women, but you have many talented women and many women who are capable of taking up those positions, but they need that little push 
what also Ruth Bader Ginsburg needed when she was pushed from her position as a federal judge to the Supreme Court of US. Well, she had her husband to do that because it required lobbying. Out here, it's the sensitization that's going to require their presence. And I will leave it at that today. This was really lovely to be on this particular panel. And I think we have lots of paths to forge. And I will only end it with my favorite saying for all young women out there, which I have always said for myself. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. So you are the tough ones. So when the going is tough there, the tough get going. Take it on. Take it on. Thank you, ma'am. But we're not letting you and sir get away so quickly. We have a couple of questions we'd like to ask. Uh, ma'am, I want to ask Thanks. you some practical advice because, you know, 14 women out of 420 senior councils have been designated by the Supreme Court, just 14. So how, how, what do you think we can do to make it a more even playing field from the perspective of us women lawyers? Sensitization yes, is on the other side, but what can we do to make it better? Yes, don't, don't make the mistakes I made. Which and, I'll I'll tell you, <laughs> and I'll tell you the mistakes I made. Yeah. See, uh, don't be self-effacing. There is no room for it today. Okay? Pick up your brief, be bold, go argue your matters. You're as good as the next person out there. You have the confidence, you can do it. You know, unfortunately for us as women, we, uh, we don't like to take the leadership positions. Women take leadership positions when they are pushed to it very often. But I think it's the time. There are many of you who are very talented and extremely good lawyers. And now you become the mentors for the others and that you become by becoming role models. So you have to move out of your comfort zone and say, I can do it and I'm going to apply for it. So at least please apply for them. Apply for your designations, move towards those lines, prepare your dockets, prepare your briefs accordingly, have a visibility and a profile. You don't have to engage councils. Please go and argue your cases. So okay, that's I what I have to say. Thanks, ma'am. We'll keep I'm that in mind. Advice. <laughs> so, yeah, I think has a question now to ask. I have this question for you, both you and ma'am. I ask, in the context of sexual crimes, offenses in uh, or offenses, in and in view of rising awareness towards LGBTQ rights, should gender identity continue to be defined by a physiological trait or be expanded to mean one's persistent inner sense of belonging to male or female or inde indeterminate gender? or one sexual orientation to put it in simple words? Yeah. Meenakshi, you want to go first or? Okay, I will do that. I just spoke about it two days back. <laughs> I was asked the same question. What does it feel when you were designated as the fifth woman senior counsel? I said, I felt very happy to be designated, but I don't like the idea that you call me as the fifth woman. You're not doing me a favor. So, so don't classify me as a woman who got designated because you needed those numbers. I'm sorry. And then I take it from a second perspective. You have to move towards a gender neutrality when it comes to profession, when it comes to your work. I don't want to be seen as a woman or a man when I appear before a judge. I'm a lawyer first and, and maybe my gender is behind me. And that reminds me of Justice, what Justice Claire Duve had said. She was a Canadian Supreme Court judge. Not and not she not. said, when, she, when they wanted to write before her, Justice Miss Claire Duve, she says, what's this miss about? I'm just Judge Claire Duve. There is no need to have our gender prefixes out there. We want an equal footing in the profession. 
or wherever we stand our genders are not going to be there it's you know so the genders should not find that place at all and therefore forget the genders and have the representations out there it somebody may say it's a dichotomy on one hand you say give women the representation on the bench on the council this thing no but if you have denied that position for so long for so many years maybe that representation but please don't do it because you are doing it as a favor to a gender no uh somia if i can answer the other part of the question on uh, expanding the definition correct yeah so i think uh, you can find the seeds of it in the nas foundation judgment and later of course in the doha uh, judgment from jo uh what is letting people uh, choose how they want to identify themselves i think we have to evolve you see the point about even these judgments whether it's a nasa judgment nas nas was said to be ahead of its time but uh, not that no longer can be the case uh, whether it's nasa or uh, you know uh, the supreme court judgment uh, having the law declared is one thing having it accepted is another so i think we would be uh, uh, naive to think that there's no homophobia in this country and uh, there is still a lot of discrimination against transgenders likewise against people who wish to identify themselves as a man or a woman or as neither and this is a work in progress i think we need to talk more about it we have to form a public opinion and we have to engage we have to bring cases to the courts as test cases all of them need not succeed but there has to be a push if you wait for the push like they thought in the uh, kaushal case in the supreme court when nas was overturned they said the legislature should do it but i think if we wait for the legislature to do it it might take a uh, too longer time i think to push the issue at various fora not just the courts but at various fora and like ruth bader ginsburg reminds us incrementally you know slowly some at a time so those steps have to be taken but they have to be multi uh, pronged the court can't be the only situs of that kind of a contestation it has to be on the floor of the legislative assemblies the parliament and public forum so we have to generate a public opinion and sizable you know uh, momentum once you gather then the push becomes easier so this has to be a work in progress the question answers itself we have to progress towards where this question wants us to progress but that's a process and we all have to engage in that process right sir thank you um so i had a question to you specifically because i don't think i can ask this question to ma'am but uh, do you think the system of designating seniors by a full bench of the court has lived its efficacy is it efficient what are your views on it i think it's got a lot of, it's got complicated it's got unnecessary and too much complicated uh but you know with so many benches and so many courts uh it's difficult for all judges to see all lawyers in action this is a practical difficulty i know for a fact having sat on the tax bench there are some remarkably good lawyers in the tax bench who appear in the tax bench but don't appear in other rosters likewise people who appear in the criminal roster not necessarily do not appear in other rosters so for all judges to have a certain opinion about a lawyer whether you know the lawyer is good enough to be designated it is a, a collegiate process so we are trying to experiment so we thought post the judgment of the supreme court which laid down those guidelines it would become you know more certain unfortunately it actually has added to more complications like for instance there is a, a marking given for uh, writings by lawyers right articles by lawyers now will you uh, evaluate a law, an article in a peer reviewed journal let's say like the harvard law review on the same footing as an article published in the op ed column of a newspaper you cannot so we still haven't formed parameters and you know and it just suddenly sprung upon lawyers that you know their writings would also be taken into consideration so i think this has to be a consultative process with the bar itself i think we need to sit down with the bar a representative uh, section of the bar and ask lawyers how they like you know parameters to be fixed for designation like it happens in england there is an element of a peer review there 
Here, the element of peer review is getting recommendations from two seniors or three seniors. Again, that's quite a pointless exercise as I see it, uh, because it doesn't truly reflect, uh, you know, the uh, capacity and competence of the lawyer. So it is a work in progress. I, I completely agree with you, Nadali, that this is not a satisfactory uh, uh, system, but we are still in an experimental phase of it, and I think we will learn through all these experiments and move towards a better system. Thank you, sir. I, I, I just wanted to uh, have a small correction to what Meenakshi said about the Otto Shankar case. Uh, Meenakshi, that privacy case was not argued by me. It was argued by Mr. Venkat Ramani. And uh, Sir Jeevan Reddy was the author of that judgment. Where I was involved was in the death penalty case. In fact, I was involved in a large number of death penalty cases which didn't succeed. So, <laughs> but it was a huge learning experience. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, you learn more through the cases you lose than the cases you succeed. And it brought me much closer to the lived lives of people. And I'm always, uh, you know, thankful to the uh, opportunity I got as an amicus curiae and to the legal services work that taught me so much about uh, law and society. Sir, I have a question. I think well, a I didn't know you were not going to speak at all about yourself. So it was <laughs> my recollection somewhere that you were involved with Otto Shankar. I did remember that. <laughs> so I remember now, okay, it was on the death penalty, but it was a very difficult matter, I remember. So I was just uh, peeking into the chat column and there is, I think there is a question about any one case which I find to be inspiring, which I did and all that, or whatever I can recollect. Uh, actually, there have been many such cases, but since it's the most often cited judgment, I'll talk of the Paschim Banga Khet Majur Samiti case, a 1995 case. And uh, I mean, all of you know the judgment. It's about a person who falls from a train is taken to uh, six government hospitals in Calcutta and is turned away by each of the hospitals saying that there is no vacant bed. And it's actually a state of emergency. Then people pool in funds and take him to a private uh, hospital and get him treated. So when the group working with agricultural workers and the, the person who fell from the train was an agricultural worker, when the group working with agricultural workers came to me and asked what can be done, I was looking at some kind of a Brandy's brief. So I said, do you have any kind of a document to show that he was taken to so many hospitals? Fortunately, they preserved all the slips given in each of the hospitals saying no bed vacant. So that formed the basis for the 32 petition. So it was a Brandy's brief and uh, one worked at, you know, developing a case for right to health because you did have the permanent cataract judgment already by then, but it was not being implemented. So even when we took it to the court, it needed a further inquiry. So the, there was a court ordered inquiry, which then established that the person had been wrongfully turned away from the hospitals. And it needed a blueprint of what can be put in place for future such cases. Now I'm under no illusion that, you know, that law is being implemented. Even today, we have many instances of people being turned away because it's a medical legal case. And, you know, unless the policeman says, I won't take this patient on, and to say no bed is vacant, every time the newspapers you hear so many instances. But this is one case I would think, you know, which was helpful to push the law forward. There are numerous other cases. The last and most recent, of course, is the case concerning manual scavenging. But I couldn't see the case to its logical end uh, because I got uh, called to the bench. But that's another case which ta taught me, you know, the value of sitting down with the people whom you're seeking to represent making them understand what is being put into a petition, understanding it in their language and, you know, making their voice heard through the petition. And uh, it is it's not an easy exercise, but it is a necessary exercise. And we can't take over the voices and the political positions of persons whom we are representing in the court. So it's not simply a dialogue between the lawyer and the bench. We must remember it's a, it's a dialogue between the constituency and the court. So that uh, awareness, I think I was constantly uh, uh, made aware of those uh, niceties in lawyering some of these causes. Thank you, sir. Um, we have we have another question for both Justice Mulitar and Minakshi, ma'am. Um, you know, both of you have been standing counsels for the Election Commission. Um, prime, uh, this is about the nota vote. 
uh, which was obviously being allowed for voters to register their dissatisfaction of the quality of candidates fielded and to prevent proxy voting. I mean, it's been seven years since it's been introduced. How do you view the nota vote as a practical functioning tool? Is it working? What, what are your views on it? <laughs> yeah, Meenakshi, both of us were lawyers for election commission, so you can't done Yes. Yes. <laughs> Both, no, I came in after you. You handled the most difficult time for election commission. I had a relatively peaceful time. So I, I'll let you take that. But having appeared in that matter, I'll share the little bit that I can from it. Okay. No, I think it, it's a question of a right to express oneself. I think that perfectly answers that need. Because you're also expressing what you think of all the candidates <clears throat> who've been offered you know, for the vote. So I, think, I, I don't think in terms of making a difference to the result, we've reached a point where that nota vote uh, is critical enough to achieve that kind of a result. And there is a possibility that uh, even that could be misused, you know, just to uh, 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 sabotage somebody's uh -huh. chances. But we've still not reached that stage. I don't think in any election so far, the percentage of nota votes has been so critical as to upset the result which may have otherwise, uh, you know, happened. But I think it should be there. I think it's an experiment worth persisting in because it is important for uh, the fray of political parties to know that there is this section of that electorate which thinks differently. Because I think if it is plurality of opinions that matter in a democracy, I think it's important to know that there is a section of that electorate which thinks that none of these candidates are worth representing that constituency. So why not? So, okay, I will share with you the background why NOTA came about. Election Commission wanted this because previously when you had ballot paper, an elector could walk in and he could scratch out the ballot paper and say, Ye sab chor hai. I don't want to vote for any one of them. And he could walk out of the polling booth and nobody would be wiser whom he had voted for or what had he done. But after the electronic voting machines came in, the process is such that if you're going to, to cast your vote, whether you have cast your vote or not, people sitting in that area will come to know. So if I don't press it, so if you didn't have nota, you had only these uh, names out there. So you had to press any one of them per force. And if you didn't do that and you walked out, the village henchman who was contesting the election will probably walk behind you and threaten you that I told you to vote and you haven't cast your vote. Now, elector's privacy and his right of his freedom to make that informed judgment when he steps into that particular polling booth. That's his freedom of expression. And you cannot take that away from him. So NOTA was brought in for two purposes. And the argument was precisely this before the Supreme Court. You have to protect the privacy of an elector. If he chooses not to vote, there should be no following him thereafter. If he's cast, willing to cast his vote or not, put the NOTA out there. And number two, the minute he enters, prior to that, it's a right, it's a completely, uh, uh, you know, a right under a statute, under the Representation of People's Act. But the actual act of voting on an informed choice is his freedom of expression, whom he wants to vote for, or whether he does not want to vote for. But that's the legalese of it. Now compare it with the second demand that is happening today, and that's on having totalizers. That means where you have two, three polling stations in an area, you're going to mix all the votes together and then you're going to declare what is the result from that area. There's a very important reason behind it. When the parties come to know that from this particular little area, we have lost, we have not won from here. The retaliation follows because the person, if they get elected from there, but they have not got vote from this small little area, then the retaliation follows in forms of development, in forms of 
providing for that particular area any kind of roads, development, etc. So there is a tremendous need that there is no disclosure and of how the electorate has voted and there's a complete protection and privacy of an elector in the matter of casting of his vote. So that was one facet for NOTA. That's the legal facet of NOTA. But, but it's not that it was not in our minds that someday NOTA can change the fortunes. Because the other countries which implemented NOTA, in some places, people, a large segment of votes had been cast, which were NOTA votes. Now, if you look at the number of votes that you have polled generally, maybe someday the issue will come up. If the NOTA votes are so much, then are you going to declare merely because somebody has got out of only 30% votes which have been polled for the two contesting candidate, one gets 15, other gets 14 or something like that. Are we going to say that he's won the election when 70% votes were NOTA? That's, that's a debate we should leave for future. Please do not activate your politicians on that. They will preempt you, you on it. So leave it for a future date. We will file, file those cases when they come at the relevant time. Right now, it's the privacy of an elector and his right of freedom of expression within that polling. Thank you, ma'am. A request, Ms. Sunita to unmute herself. She has posted a couple of questions in the chat window. Perhaps she would like to ask herself. Sunita, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Soumya. No, I To Justice Murlidhar, my question was, how, how does one... What's your mantra of maximizing the output from all the reading that one can do? And then another question was, how do you deal with professional um, ethical uh, dilemma? Because as, as, as professionals, I think we are, uh, as a lawyer, you are your own watchdog, your own guardian all the time. So I, I'm, as a judge also, and as a lawyer, perhaps. And this question is to both of you, um, uh, Justice Murlidhar and uh, Madam Arora, uh, Arora Minakshi, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Samya. Uh, so, as far as the reading part is concerned, in fact, this is a suggestion I have uh, made on several occasions. One is to form small study circles, because you may read something, but uh, your understanding of it, and just like Meenakshi said, you know, there are different perspectives you bring to the reading of a provision. And uh, recently, when I was giving a talk on legal education, I happened to read uh, writings on fem feminist jurisprudence. And there is something to be said for the male voice in the law. The way law is written, the way law is interpreted, and by judges who are essentially male, uh, the law starts uh, being read and interpreted in a certain way. And as like Minakshi was rightly saying, what if women were to sit down to write the law? So today you have a judgment writing project. Women are involved in a judgment writing project in one of the leading law universities. And I'm very curious to know the output there where they're trying to see if women were to write this judgment, how, and I don't think we should even restrict it to women. No, no, not yet. I'll call you later. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that involves rights of minorities, rights of the underprivileged. What if those constituencies were to interpret the law? What if they were to read it or write it? So uh, you need to have different voices. So whatever you read, if you can form small study circles, where you share what you read and you discuss, I think you'll have a better understanding of what you read and that's how you can maximize, I suppose, uh, whatever reading you do. And uh, Meenakshi, you want to come in on me? Um, see, I, I think you need a diversity in reading and you must read both points of views. So I, although I am a hugely gender right protective person, but I will always tell myself that I do want the male perspective on it. And uh, uh, I also feel that we cannot take our feminism and our gender movement beyond a skewed point because then it will start to work against ourselves. So you have to have a balance in whatever that you choose. And therefore, it's very important to read both perspectives. And in any case, remember, when you are fighting on a case, which is an issue-based case, 
if you do not read the other perspective it will come back and haunt you in the court from the other side so it's important that you read the perspective and you have balance and this i'm talking when you do matters which have huge issues or sensitive issues and all but not your routine stuff we read judgments and we know what is set out but when you are chartering a territory which is otherwise previously uncharted then it's very important to read both the perspectives and i am i'm very particular on that and i i find that even today when i do matters on certain women right issues uh it bothers me that we have really gone and messed up with section 498a okay most of you are very young you wouldn't remember but i remember my early days getting up every morning reading a newspaper one woman burnt here another one killed another dowry death etc 498a did a lot of good because there was a message but where have we brought that 498a today we have brought it to a point that you had that arnish kumar judgment on 498a and we've completely diluted it and bad so i really feel that it is very important for women and i'm talking it from a woman perspective here just now i'm not talking it in terms of a general thing i i would say it's very important to read both both perspectives is very important to draw a balance when you are in the court and remember as a woman go out argue all your cases but have a balance because the minute you tilt that particular balance you would be looked upon as being like shrewish i can use that phrase if i may so the balance in your arguments which you draw is very very important thing. and that comes from reading it comes from reading all sides all both perspectives you know i was just reading the other day that how the all most legislations had been originally framed by men and they did not have the women perspective in them today when you interpret interpret those legislations that's when you bring in the perspectives and you bring it in with the balance but thank you to... sorry yeah yeah that's it right uh, we'll end it with the one last question from kavita kavita please do ask uh, uh, the question yourself this is some practical advice from people who from both of you uh kavita if you're there i'm there uh, so and ma'am i i really need to know because i find myself at loss in dealing with such situations in the court at times we find very unkind and unjudge kind of remarks falling from the judges uh in supreme court more i feel i i have seen the situation and i i really find myself at loss to understand how to deal with such situations in the court I, if we react then a lawyer should not react but i find myself at loss to deal with certain situations in the court when a judge makes such unkindly remarks in the court during the hearing that's my question I hope I was audible. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you have put, you have put. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's I'm a difficult sorry, word. This really is over to you. <laughs> this is somewhere I really need the guidance. So I would yeah, really yeah, I have something to say, but after you, Molly. Yes, I think the judge yes. perspective is very yes. important here. Yes, sure, sure. Yes. One is, uh, I mean, I can't. I, I don't think you can be excused. Uh, a bad behavior on the bench is bad behavior, all right. The question is, how do you deal in that situation? Because I know the dilemma that uh, every lawyer faces: so that if you take on the judge, the person getting hurt is the client. The lawyer can come, the lawyer can apologize, the judge will say yes, yes, you know, I accept the apology. If <laughs> it's actually, you know, uh, uh, the uh, lawyer who. Uh, was a reason, but uh, it's a very difficult thing to deal with at that point in time. One, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> as a lawyer, I have faced it myself. I must tell you this. Yes. Uh, when I asked a judge to, I simply said, "Please bear with me." And uh, the next ten minutes, I got a earful for using that expression, "Please bear with me." 
I didn't know what wrong I had committed. And <laughs> at the end of the case was thrown out. I still did not have a clue. So yes. I had to come out, ask a few senior lawyers there. I mean, what happened? I mean, because it threw me completely. Then they said, by saying, please bear with me, you're suggesting to the court that they're impatient. And that suggestion that you give the court that they could be impatient could be offensive to the judge. I mean, so that was a huge learning experience for me. But one is that uh, strengthening oneself emotionally from within. Because you are going to be dealing with uh, human beings on the bench. And my senior told me this, that ultimately the person sitting on the bench is another human being who has uh, come in a certain frame of mind and who at that point in time is in a certain frame of mind. And uh, this is the way the whole adversarial system is, where at the end of 20 cases, yours is the 21st, the judge is in a certain frame of mind. The judge doesn't get up to say, you know, let me cool off and come back with a calmer frame of mind. There are judges who do that. <coughs> simple girl, and I can share this with you. When I try and follow that, he says, never pass an order in anger. Whenever you feel so angry that you're not in control of your emotions and responses as a judge, the best thing is either to say, I will take this case up later or to case, take this case on another <coughs> There have been instances of the judge actually retiring to the chambers to calm oneself and come back. Unfortunately, the lawyer doesn't have that luxury. So I yes. think we should have in our judicial academies greater sensitization uh, workshops. And even among lawyers, you should have discussions on how do you deal with <coughs> situations? How do you deal with difficult judges? Because uh, whatever we discussed today here, <coughs> To have this problem tomorrow when you go to the court. There might be one unreasonable judge who makes an uncharitable comment and you will need to deal with that unreasonable judge or uncharitable comment. And uh, this can only happen through greater sensitization and more talking about it. I would think like with, uh, uh, the more we talk about it, the more uh, there will be an acknowledgement of the problem. Today we are in denial. And most judges would like to believe that they are perfect, and they're calm, they're composed, and they're not. And uh, we need to find out in an adversarial system, like they had a study in Israel, when they found that uh, you know, in a criminal court, which, is, which had too many cases, the best chances of your getting bail was in the first one and a half hours. Yeah. After lunch, there would be a lot of, lot of adjournments. Post mm -hmm. lunch, maybe we be a dismissal. Because the judge is mentally tired, and it's an onslaught from the judge's point of view, and you're not registering beyond a point. And all of you will vouch for this, even with a judge like me, many of you would have noticed that I have high points and low points in a day. You know, so the more experienced lawyers will know the frame of, like Meenakshi would certainly know with her vast experience, is this, is today a good day to push this point with this court? So there are some uh, senior lawyers, that's, that's I think also why they are sought after because they know to deal with these situations. But I think every lawyer needs to deal with these situations because they're never, situations are never going to be tailor-made. So one, one, one has to strengthen oneself, steal oneself emotionally from within and not let the judge distract you. Not let the judge take you away. So you maybe you want to lower your tone, then we, which means overall the tone gets lowered. But the stand and this comes only through experience. And uh, Minakshi can probably share with us how she deals with this. <laughs> well, uh, as I told you, it's not an easy going in your early years. You face this situation. I think each one of us has faced it sometime or the other. See, one thing is that you have to learn to develop a hide and lose that sensitive and emotional side aside. Okay? Because if you let that observation or a remark hurt you, you're going to lose a control of your matter. The minute you let it emotionally impact you and you lose a control or charge of your case, your client will suffer, but it's a downward spiral in the matter. Because then you will start defending yourself. So the easiest way, now this is being a practical class, the easiest way is forget what it is 
I'm sorry, my lords, but my point is this, this, this. So bring him back to the case. And and just please put your put your ego. There's going to be a long while before we will have the privilege of being okay. able to say that my ego is hurt. As of now, with our numbers and our positions, we do not have that privilege. The second problem that many of you are going to face, you know, I'm very happy with virtual hearings. Why? Because my very loud male colleagues cannot interrupt my argument in a virtual. Now, what happens in a courtroom with my, with my male colleagues who have lovely, loud, booming voices, lovely baritone, they hog the entire ear of my judge. If I was to scream, my voice is going to become shrill. The judge is going to say, just shut up, woman. Your voice is so shrill. It's hard on my ear. ear. So remember one thing. As women, we can't raise our voices. Our voices will become shrill. They are not very pleasant on anyone's ear. The trick that I learned early on in my career days was to find that one slot which was, they were not talking bungee. Move it. So just move in. The minute you move in, you will realize that most of your judges do realize the difficulty that women have. They hear you. But find that slot when everyone has exhausted themselves out. And you will find that slot to get whatever you want to say to be said, and you will find that you will get your judges here. But if you start jumping in when all your male colleagues are with their loud voices, are saying things, you're not going to make yourself audible. But see, in previous times, in my early years, it was a gender was definitely an issue. But now, gender is not as much an issue anymore. I, I do feel there is, a, there is a shift there. Okay, so the judges will hear you. And if you feel that you're not being heard, just stay there, have your patience and say, look, I have a point to make and find your place there when the other side is quiet. You're not going to be able to make it when everyone else is there screaming. <laughs> That's. A... Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would ask uh, Neoma to give the vote of thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Naomi. Uh, just, just to wrap up. Uh, it lately it's becoming more and more essential uh, for all of us to keep listening to more and more positive stories. It is just something that helps us keep uh, you know, afloat in the present times. So thank you so much, Dr. Murlidhar and Minakshi ma'am for sharing your experience and the wisdom. Uh, I thank uh, Mrinalini and Soumya for moderating this session uh, so nicely. Uh, Mercy and Daisy, thank you so much for your the beautiful rendition of Abide By Me. Uh, not the least, Nandita, Iram, Sunita, Kritika, and Suruchi for all the behind-the-scene work uh, without which this uh, session would not have been possible. Most of us uh, cannot uh, give, you know, uh, get into all of that. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce the next virtual canteen, which is on the 16th of October, 5 p.m. Justice Rekha Sharma and Justice Usha Mehra will be with us on their journey in law. Uh, Ms. Sharuk Alam and Ms. Shivani Lutra Loya will be moderating the session. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very so much for having thank us. You so thank, much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Kathy. Hi, ma'am. <laughs> How are you? We are, How are, we, are live. <laughs> we are live. So, <laughs> it was a very good session.